All right. Welcome back to session one here. Um, and uh, I think I think you can all see me. Uh, as you imagine, there's a bit of uh, technology delays going on all over the place. I have like four screens up. So if I ever have some weird uh, um, misunderstood face on the screen, it's uh, it's because I'm doing about eight things at a time. Um, but our next speaker will not be. Our next speaker is going to blow you away. Uh, my friend Karen Baker is the Communications and Marketing Manager for Clean Water Services in Hillsborough, Oregon. Karen recently celebrated 20 years of navigating the district's marketing, branding, communications, research, and public education programs. Prior to Clean Water Services, she was a publicist for book publishing companies in Portland, Oregon, and Minneapolis, Minnesota. Karen has a Bachelor of Arts degree in both speech communication and in both speech communications and Spanish from the University of Minnesota and certificates in business management and marketing from Portland State School of Business. Karen is going to blow you away. I cannot wait for, uh, for you to hear from her. Karen, take it away. Boy, that, that, that's quite the setup, so I appreciate that. And I'm assuming everybody can see me because I have turned off my camera because what do I need to look at myself? So, so if uh, anything is evident is that we are passionate about the water business. And I thank Stephanie and Ariane for that setup because it's only going to get more passionate from here, folks. So anyway, what I really wanted to start out by saying is, is first, of course, I want to thank you for all joining us this morning. I hope you've all had your coffee because we're going to have some fun. So, so we're, we're smart people. I, I hope you all think you're smart people. I, you know, I think I've gotten to the point in my life where I have more confidence in myself. So I feel that I've earned the right to say I'm a smart person, but we're, we're educated. Uh, we're communicators, we're scientists. Yes, we're scientists. Um, and obviously we're passionate about our work protecting public health and the environment. We, we feel the same way about our community, right? We, they're smart, you know, we, they have similar values, hopefully to the values that we hold. So we're in this business um, and we all want a safe and healthy environment. So we're pretty much, we're pretty confident that our audiences listen to or change their behaviors based on our messages, all our messages that we deliver to them. Uh, our customers hang on every word. They attend every one of our public meetings. Uh, they do what we want them to do because we're trying to help them, right? So of course they listen and do everything that we tell them to do. Uh, they support every endeavor, every, every endeavor and therefore our work is done. That's why every river is pristine. That's why storm drains no longer have oil. Soap from car washing, soap from pressure washing. Uh, no fertilizer ever runs off a lawn into a storm drain. Every lawn that you see when you're driving by has a little tuna can sitting in it and their water and hoses are on a timer and it shuts off when that tuna can hits one inch. And of course, no wipe has ever, ever seen the inside of a toilet bowl. So uh, quite the utopia, right? We know that's not true, at least not yet. And I'd like to say it's a little bit of, of job security in a way. So, um, why aren't folks doing what we need them to do? Um, why aren't we connecting in the way that we, we really feel needs to be, the way that it needs to be done in order that we feel we can make an impactful um, impression on our community? So let's embark on a little brain study and learn how to speak the lizard brain language. So with that, I'm gonna ask, are you, awake yet. It's pop quiz time. So uh, for those of you who have kids in school, you, you, and you probably remember what pop quizzes were. So we're going to, we're going to embark on this a little bit here. So first of all, we are going to take part in what's called a Stroop test. So the following words will, will spell out a color. 
and I want you to say out loud the color that you see. For example, this color that's going to pop up right now, you should say blue. Okay. So this Stroop test was named after J. Ridley Stroop in the 1930s. And for my conductor on the other side of the screen who's running my slides here, I'm going to say the, the two letter word go, but don't do it yet. And then that will help us run through this test. So when we're ready. So hopefully you've all had your coffee. Um, I can't hear you, unfortunately. I don't think anyone else can hear you unless you're in the room with other people. So be emphatic. I want you to say these colors. Remember, you're saying, I want you to say out loud the color that you see and let's have some fun. So ready, set, go. Okay, stop. How did you do? Not bad at first, right? Until you kind of got the hang of it. Um, but hopefully all those colors came through appropriately on your screens as they do ours here. So, so we're gonna try another round because one just isn't enough. So, okay, ready, set, go. Okay, stop. So did you do better or worse? So again, I can't hear you, so hopefully you're being honest, but hopefully you're getting a little bit better because now you've been practiced. So, so try speaking a little louder. We're gonna try our last round. Ready, set, go. Okay, stop right there. So fun stuff, eh? Um, and the traditional Stroop test, um, you can find it on YouTube, it's very fun. Um, it kind of runs through it pretty quickly. So uh, there's a lot of stuff that um, you can do with that Stroop test to really test how your brain works. So, so this test was actually, like I said, discovered by uh, Dr. Stroop. Um, I found it on the show Brain Games, which really, I have to admit, sparked or even furthered my interest in how the brain works and responds to messages. Um, so a few years ago, Brain Games, in fact, was a show that it was the only show really that I think my whole family could watch and we all enjoyed. And my daughter, who was younger at the time in elementary school would actually do better on these brain games than my husband and myself. And I think that has to do with um, the way that our brains and, and the way that our brains develop at certain stages in your life because she's younger and that prefrontal cortex hasn't been developed. And that is gonna be a big part of um, what's gonna influence or how we're gonna talk about um, how the brain works today for the lizard brain. So here's a quick question I have for you um, before we go to the next slide. So, so how did you react when I said pop quiz? Um, did you straighten up? Did you roll your eyes? Um, did, did you get excited? I mean, why would you react even before you knew what this test or this thing was? You didn't even know what it was about. You didn't, you know, but you actually did. You had some history in your head. And I think that's really what we're, what's going to influence, um, you know, how we operate. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, brain, for lack of a better phrase, has a mind of its own. So uh, let's really discuss what the Stroop test tells us. So Dr. Stroop determined that the brain is stuck on autopilot and it really, really craves shortcuts. And the other thing he determined is that automatic reading doesn't require focused attention. And finally, that 
processing color requires more attention and time. So it, it's actually really great insight into multitasking, right? I mean, are you really, really thinking clearly when you're doing more than one thing or two or three things at once, which I, you know, I've been known to do. Um, some say we should actually teach ourselves how to do unitasking instead. So the, the brain gets overwhelmed and tired. Um, I've actually said out loud while I was working on a project, my, my brain hurts um, while I'm concentrating so much, uh, which is recently, I mean, that recently happened to me while putting together um, an Ikea desk. So and we've all been there. But because the brain is complex, there are many experts who study this amazing organ. I like to call them the brainiacs. So uh, let's explore their fields or the fields of brain study. So first of all, for brainiacs, there are our neuroscientists, right? They study the development and the function of the nervous system. It, it, it's the brain, the, the spinal cord and the nerve cells. And then we have the neuropsychologists and they actually study how the brain influences cognitive functions and behavior. It's, it's obviously the mix between psychology and neurology. Um, in fact, I heard someone say that uh, neuro, neuropsychology is, is actually started way back when, and you could actually consider magicians neuropsychologists, um, but we'll talk about that why in a little bit. And then finally, let's talk about neuromarketers which is what hopefully you will all be by the end of this presentation. Neuromarketers study the brain's uh, responses to advertising and branding and the adjustment of those messages based on feedback for the responses that we want to elicit. So it's why audiences make the decisions that they do. And you know, I want to step back a little bit. Marketing is providing value. Um, it is persuasion, but it's it's, it's about providing value to solve a need, to solve someone's problem. I would assume every, every one of you listening and watching right now is in that same boat. That is what your goal is, right? We want to solve someone's problem. And marketing in the traditional sense and now is about the, the right product or message given to the right audience. So it's specific, it's customized, using the right channel, right? That, that's what we do. So it really, really is about speaking to the subconscious needs of an audience to create a positive and memorable impact. So I want to tell you about a few historical brainiacs, so to speak, who are instrumental in their fields of study and really, really helped us understand, you know, how the brain processes information. So I'm sure, and I hope you've all heard of this phrase, I think Therefore, I am. And that was Rene Descartes. He was a French philosopher and mathematician. He said that emotions and rationality are separate in the body. However, neuroscientist Antonio DiMaggio disagreed. And he came along and said, you know what? We're not thinking machines that feel. We are feeling machines that think. He actually wrote a book in 94 called Descartes' Air, and where he was looking at that, I think, um, therefore I am. And he disagreed. He said, emotions are essential to normal human behavior. Then in 2003, Dr. Reed Montague came along. Um, he was a, neuro, or is a neuroscientist at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. And he actually came in and said, you know what? I, I remember that Pepsi and Coke challenge. They uh, ran that challenge back in the 1970s. And what came out of that is that folks actually preferred Pepsi over Coke and blind taste tests. So if that was true, why is Coke, uh, was Coke at that time? And now why is Coke dominating the market? So he cooked folks up to an FM MRI machine um, to track the brain waves. So what he found is that 50% chose Pepsi over Coke, okay, in the blind test test, didn't tell him. However, his second group, when he told them which was Pepsi and which was Coke, three to one chose Coke, or excuse me, yeah, three to one chose Coke over Pepsi. 
So what he concluded, and it's very, very important, is that he actually saw what parts of the brain were lighting up while they were taking these tests. And he found that it was the prefrontal cortex, obviously, which controls higher thinking. That's where your language is, and we'll explore the brain uh, more in depth in a little bit. Then the reward and pleasure, which is your taste, is your ventral putamen. I'd love to point to it, but you know, it's in here somewhere, more in the center of your brain. And then the other part that lit up, which is the key to this point that I'm making was the hippocampus, which was the memory. So what he concluded is that the brain is recalling the images and the ideas from the commercials and that the thoughts and the emotions connected to the branding were actually overriding the reactions to the quality of the product. So those commercials in the 1980s, for those of you who were lucky to be around then, as myself, um, and, and we're watching TV at that time. So I do remember those Pepsi challenges. Um, and so you can see the impact that that had. So you, you had, the, the key, key point that I wanna make here is that the brain roots for shortcuts. I mean, that's the main thing, the, the memories, and it's the experiences and it's the emotions over overriding a laundry list of the benefits and value judgments and risks. So brain basics. I wanna, I told you we were gonna do this. Let's dive a little bit deeper to peek inside the brain a little bit. So we'll stop right here, conductor on my other side. Side. So this, this, this is your brain. And the reason I put that in quotes is again, for those of you who were coherent and, and watching TV in the 1980s, like myself, you may remember the commercials. I believe they were anti-drug uh, campaign where this is your brain and the person was standing by the stove and cracked two eggs and then it would bubble and the brain would fry, or excuse me, the eggs would fry, just supposed to symbolize your brain frying on drugs. But this is your brain. And then the next comment was, this is your brain on drugs. So I just thought that was appropriate to put in there. But so first I wanna say is that the brain actually makes up 2% of your body mass. However, it burns 20% of your energy, of the energy that your body uses. So first I wanna show you what 10% of your brain, of that 20%, 10% of your brain is controlled by the cognitive and rational part of your brain. We talked about the neocortex a little bit earlier. And that's language. That's where your language comes from. That's where conscious decisions come from. That's an operative word, conscious. But uh, it's actually very slow and lazy. So second of all, we want to look at the next part of the brain, which is very important. And this is the lizard brain, the primal brain. You'll hear it called the, the reptile brain as well. And this is 90%. So of that 20% that takes up your energy, 10% is cognitive. The rest of it is all under the subconscious. It's this primal brain. It is this primal brain that is driving everything that you do. Um, so it's selfish. It's, it's, it's unconscious, as we've mentioned. It controls your body functions. It's always on and it's quick. There's actually a third part, and I don't wanna say it's a sub part of this primal and lizard, lizard brain, but it's what actually folks have called the limbic and the emotional side of the brain. And that actually is actually part of this primal and lizard brain, but I felt it was important to call it out. Plus, I didn't have enough room on my screen to kind of go vertical. So I had to go horizontal. So there we go. So the limbic and the emotional part of your brain, it's the behaviors, it's your senses, it's your gut feelings, it's emotional, it's trust, it's loyalty. Those are where your true decisions are made. So your brain, your, your lizard brain, um, and the majority of your brain for that sake is always scanning the environment for threats. And um, you've got to remember the lizard brain is pre-verbal and it craves mental shortcuts. Um, it prefers images over words and experiences over long explanations. So too many messages today are under the illusion that we can go straight to the rational brain, to the neocortex. They're unfortunately tech-centric, they're cognitive, they're heavy, and they fail to engage the lizard brain. So how do we speak to and stimulate the lizard brain to move people to action? 
So we're going to talk about stimuli. So the first stimuli is personal. What's in it for me? You know, it, I'm in, you know, I'm in survival mode. It, it's my family. It's my pets. It's my home. It's my wallet. Okay. The second stimuli to speak to the lizard brain is contrastable. Always talk about what's before and after the good, bad, the with, without. What's life with your product or your construction project or your, your message? And what's life without? I mean, and always make sure to limit your claims to three, just as an FYI. The next one is tangible. It's about evidence, nothing complicated. The lizard brain does not have concept of time and future. Um, we like to say at Clean Water Services, a watershed's like a great big bowl. So seeing is believing or seeing the image in your head is believing, make it tangible. The fourth one, memorable. The, the brain is not on a mission to store a lot of information. Uh, memorize the events at the beginning and at the end. So basically you'll remember my first slide and my last slide. So this part, you know, it's probably going in one ear at the other. Okay, fifth one, visual. This is the most important one. This is the dominant channel in your brain. Um, we are basically visual thinking or visual making machines. So visual decision making machines and photos and infographics. I mean, you know this. I mean, we're all communicators. Seeing is believing. And finally, emotional. Speak to the heart to get to the mind. So the, the hard part, even though this lizard brain is always on and it's running no matter you know what happens around a, a person, it, it's really important for us to still get into people's values. So that's an additional layer and that, that's really important work um, that comes with survey work, for example. So people, like I said, people aren't usually able to articulate what motivates them. So I, like I said, that all this stuff is going on in your brain, your lizard brain is on autopilot, but it's important to also know um, people's values. And that's where surveys come into play, uh, qualitative surveys. There are really good surveys out right now where um, instead of asking people, um, would you support this endeavor? Would you support this construction project or this stream improvement project? Instead, what they do is they actually ask people a simple question, explain what, a, or excuse me, draw what a healthy, what healthy stream looks to you and have them draw it um, and kind of um, speaking to them personally. And that usually helps. So, so now let's put all these into action. I want you to take a look at the following images and see if you can identify the lizard brain stimuli. And I really wanted to run this so I could see your, the chat and have you guys say stuff out loud, but um, just in the essence of time is, um, you know, what do you think? I'll give you a second to look at this photo, for example. Um, you know, it, it, you see people in a boat. I mean, I really think it makes it more personal. I think it speaks to the visual aspect. I think it's a little bit, you know, emotional. So I think that's kind of fun that way. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, infrastructure, you all be used this word, I'm sure many times, but I'm going to give you a suggestion. Okay, Maestro, if you want to hit the, the slide there. Pipes, pumps, and plants. I think this is a little bit more, uh, we'll hit pipes, pumps, and plants. A little more personable. Um, I think it's more memorable um, because it's a little bit simpler. Okay, let's go to the next slide. The next thing really quickly, this was a letter I received after I paid my water bill here in Portland, Oregon. I love that not only is thank you in there, thank you is bolded. So that really speaks to me. That's really personal. I think it's emotional. Um, I think it is just very nice. So I really encourage you to do something like this. Okay, let's go to the next one. So we're gonna be conscious of time so we can get to questions. Beautiful clean water for today and tomorrow. We use this at Clean Water Services, this image in this, these words very frequently. Um, the main thing with this we wanted to get across is that it's visual. We're all about outcomes. We're not showing our pipes, pumps, and plants. We're showing the end result. So for me, it's very tangible and very visual and emotional. Okay, let's go to the next one. This one, obvious, it's before and after, to Alton River in 1959, to Alton River today, contrasting. Let's go to the next one. Happy smiling people studies show that when you see faces smiling and happy, it kind of elicits a happy emotion in yourself. So I say this is very visual and emotional and tangible, personal. Next one. And this is Bella, her garden. We can actually see this fertilizer. That's our clean water grow in action. So I think that's very tangible. 
Uh, next one really quickly, we I'll wait till that comes up. Employees saying thank you. We were trying to find a way to thank our essential employees. We figured the photos spoke louder than words, a little bit more tangible. Um, obviously anything you guys can show with folks outcomes, folks actually doing the work in the lab is always great to show that we are, there is science behind the work that we do. I'd say memorable and visual. And finally, the last, the most important, and I think John Gonzalez is always, we are gonna hear from next, um, seeing is believing. Here's a dissolved toilet paper in the first one. Here's a flushable wipe, wipe, and there's a cleaning wipe. It's pretty darn obvious wipes do not dissolve. So in summary, I really, really hope you guys can find a way to be human, okay? Remember, you're human and you're speaking to humans. What speaks to you, what gets you motivated, um, back to the pop quiz. When you heard those words, did you straighten up? You know, um, maybe we should start calling pop quizzes discovery exercises. Anyway, there's a lot of memories that pop up when you hear these things that you're familiar with. Again, the lizard brain operates the same across all humans, but um, if you want to dive deeper, you really have got to get into people's values. And that's why qualitative research is so important, but that's another presentation. Um, I can't stress enough, during a crisis, such as a pandemic, coincidentally, it's even more difficult for folks to focus on complicated or detailed messages. Um, we need short headlines, uh, short calls to action, and simple graphics. Uh, you hear this before, show, don't tell. Um, I tried to do that with this presentation a little bit. I tried to use lots of white space, short lists, colorful graphics. I tried not to use more than three in a list. Um, remember, your brain, the lizard brain, which is on autopilot, always prefer, prefers images over words and experiences over long explanations. So it's okay to talk about the future. In fact, that's what folks want right now during this pandemic. They need hope more than ever right now. And um, it's not about being fancy. And you heard Ariana Stephanie say this, I say this all time. Now more than ever, it's important to be authentic, be real be simple, be clear, um, you know, show people, show what, you know, life looks like when, you know, with investments that how where rates are going, show that they're actually going to make an impact, show, show, show. So the biggest thing is people, we really need to let them know how your efforts are going to impact their pocketbook, their wallet, how they're going to impact their future and their quality of life. So show them the before, show them the after, show them what's in it for them. So finally, speak to the heart to get to the mind. So do you feel like a neuromarketer right now? I have tons of resources too. I'd love to mention we were running out of time. So I'd like to hopefully have time for a few questions. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Karen. Really appreciate those thoughts. Um, super amazing. I, I know I'm blown away by uh, just the visuals you showed there. Um, a quick question is, you know, how, how do you start when you're going to prepare something uh, that's intended to get at somebody's lizard brain? Where do you begin? I think the big thing is, and I'll say it again, it's always good to do surveys. And I know most people don't have the time or the money to do those, but I think it's it's literally talking, like, almost like you're talking to a 10 year old. I mean, really, it really is keeping things simple. Um, I'll say this really quickly too. And I think Ariane and Stephanie just uh, kind of touched on this a little bit. You know, we're, we're scientists too, you know? I mean, I, we're not trying to pull one over on anybody, but the thing is to actually slow down and speak in simple terms to, to decode the engineering speak that, that takes a big skill. And I think sometimes we need to remember that less is more. So I'll say this again, a good communication plan always helps. And uh, I mean, we, we spend millions of dollars on projects and we create these big sewer master plans in my case, for example, working for a, a water resources agency. Our communications plans should follow suit. We should put as much time and as much effort into a plan. Because again, I'll say it again, I may not have the, the the PE after my title, but I do feel like communicators were scientists as well. So a good communication plan. And again, you don't need a lot, a lot of uh, big fancy words or big fancy actions, just some simple, 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 emotional and heartfelt messages. Awesome. Well, thank you, Karen. Appreciate you being here today. Karen will be around in the networking and in the chat if you have more questions for her. Um, but we're going to pop over to session two uh, that way. 
and uh, hear from John Gonzalez. So thank you.